just want to welcome you all here. My name is Mark. Um, I'm one of the pastors here at the Warman location. And today we have what we like to call, or we're doing what we like, we like to call Partnership Sunday. Um, we have some visitors here, and so I'll kind of explain this as we go through. But uh, a lot of us are new here and don't know each other that well because we're so new. We've been officially meeting since September. And so there's a lot of new people here who don't really know a lot about what Grace Fellowship is about, how Grace Fellowship functions. Um, you don't know other people here. And so today what I want to do is just kind of explain how we as Grace Fellowship view church membership or church partnership, um, how that really fleshes out in the local body of believers, um, how to implement these understandings in, in the way we live our lives day to day. And so I want to... Um, kind of start off by saying this. Now, I know we've had, a, we've had uh, quite a few people partner with us since September, uh, people that have started coming to Grace Fellowship Warm and Location. We're, we're a new plant from Saskatoon, from a church there. But um, as of today, you're no longer partners here. Now, that might be a shocker, but this is what we do every year. It kind of sounds mean, I guess. But every year, beginning of January, the first or second week in January, we do what we call Partnership Sunday. And... Uh, what we do is we partner together for a year, typically. We don't do any longer than that. We do a year. And then we go through this every year in January. We just remind you what it means to be a partner in the body of believers. And you have an opportunity after the service or throughout the year to uh, fill out a partnership form, sign it, and hand it in to either Clay or myself or put it in the offering box. Um, but before uh, you all go signing partnership forms and being partners with us here, uh, I just want to explain what that actually means and what that looks like today and, and how we partner with Jesus on his gospel mission. So um, what we'll do is we'll just play the scripture video and uh, we'll get into what church partnership means. Reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 36 through 47. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his words were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Why don't we just uh, pray before we dig into this. Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you for what you have done for us on the cross. And because of what you've done for us, we just pray that you would push us to be on mission for you. Um, this might sound a bit cliche, Lord, but uh, we know that you have a battleground for us as a church, and it's the city of Warman. Um, Lord, we just want to spread this message of your work in this city. We'll have to do it together as a body of believers, and not one of us can do this work on our own, God. Um, so we just pray for unity, a vision, and mission, and just a deep love for you and for one another, a love that cares deeply for the needs of others. And we don't know how to put all these things together on our own, but Lord, you can help us. You are amazing, and you show up when those who follow you are really out of their depth and really have to completely rely on you. We just, we just pray for this today, Lord, and for this in your name. Amen. So I'm going to start off today, uh, not with the verses that you saw in the video, but I, I'm, I'm going to get to those. But I want to start off in verses 12 and 13 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you want to find that in your phone, on your app, or whatever you have, you maybe have a Bible. Um, and I'm just going to start reading from verses 12, and I'll read verses 12 and 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For just as the body is one and has many members... 
and all the members of the body, though many are one, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So when Paul writes these verses to the Corinthians, he's trying to describe to them what a body of believers looks like. We will not all be the same, just like a body. It has many parts, but we will all have one thing in common. We're all part of this body. And Paul uses the idea of baptism to show whether or not you are, are part of the body or not. And in verse 13, he says, you were all baptized into one body and were made to drink of one spirit. So this is the one unifying thing that holds all the believers together. We can see that all over the New Testament, that, that baptism was sort of synonymous with being a believer in Jesus Christ. And as soon as people believed in the gospel, they were baptized to show their belief in Christ to the world around them. Now, this is what drew them together. It wasn't the baptism, but it was the, the common bond of having the Holy Spirit within them or Jesus, uh, the common uh, theme of loving Jesus Christ. And this made them part of something larger than themselves. Today's church culture has changed the dynamics of baptism a bit, I guess. And often people who have gone to church for many, many years have never been baptized. And because of it, it, it sort of somehow signified the next step in your Christian walk. Um, sort of like if you reach a certain level of Christianity, then you can be baptized. And this wasn't the case in the New Testament. People believed and were baptized, drawing them into the body of believers. Uh, so one of the requirements for being part of the local Grace Fellowship body of believers is not that you're baptized with water, but if you believe in Jesus Christ. And at the time when Paul wrote this to the church in Corinth, it would have been assumed that you were baptized. So that is really our only requirement to enter into a partnership with Grace Fellowship as well, that you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross. That one thing is the same in all of us, and it's really the most important thing. We love Jesus. We've devoted our lives to him. We're in complete amazement and awe of what he's done for us. We want to share it with others. That's kind of what draws us together. And other than that one thing, we're all going to be very different people and look very different in how we use the gifts that God's given us. We're going to look different in how we share the gospel. We're going to look different in how we serve the church around us. Only that one thing keeps us together. And that's the common belief that Jesus Christ died for all. And it's our job as a body to share the good news however possible. Each using his or her very diverse gifts to do the job in their own way and in their own capacity. So in a very short order, the one thing we all have in common was that we love Jesus Christ. Everything else is going to be very diverse. If we just continue reading in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, there we'll see uh, verses 14 and 15. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. So we can see here that there are many different parts of the body. And they all have different jobs with different appearances, uh, different ways of doing things. But as with your physical body, the body of Christ always has one goal in mind, one direction and one focus. Sort of like a, an athlete. I'll just kind of explain it like, um, kind of like a, a goalie in hockey has one job to do. It's keep the puck out of the net. That's his one focus. A shutout really is his ideal, uh, ideal outcome. And it's kind of the same or similar as the body of Christ. Our goal is for more people to come to know the saving power of Jesus Christ and to make much of Jesus. That's our goal. And just like a goalie's body, we have many parts in our body that take part in the ultimate goal. The goalie in hockey uses his feet to stop the pucks. He uses his arms, his hands, his face sometimes. But they all do it in different ways, right? I mean, the hand's going to stop the puck in a different way than the foot does. Your face is going to uh, feel it differently than the foot does. You know, but the ultimate goal of the goalie is to stop the pucks. Even though the job description is similar, the way they do it is very different. So if we, let's continue on. Read verses 16 and 17. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? And if the whole body were an ear where would be the sense of smell? Now, I'm just going to take this analogy with the goalie just a little bit further. Um, if we're all one body on one mission, how does that look like in, say, the life of a hockey goalie? If the goalie's eyes stop working, because, hey, really, they're not involved in the game at all, are they? I mean, they play no part in actually stopping pucks. Uh, they're protected behind the mask and, uh, so they don't get hurt. Um, 
they just seem like sort of a liability. You can't even touch them really without hurting. Have you? I don't know if you've ever tried touching your eye, but it kind of hurts when you do. And so, I mean, really, the eye can't ha, has nothing to do with hockey. Has nothing to do with being a goalie. It seems like a really weak part of the body. But what happens if his eyes are gone? The vision is gone. The mission of the goalie is lost. He can no longer do his job. Even though the parts of him that physically stop the pucks, like the arms, the feet, the chest, the, you know, the, the head, whatever, those parts are all still there and very intact and very healthy. But it would be useless for him to be on the ice without eyes. It's the same way with us as believers. We can only be on a collective mission when all the parts are functioning together. Whether you're an eye or an ear or any other part of the body, as a body of believers, we need you to do your part in order to be effective missionaries in the communities we're in. So let's read verses 18 to 20, just continuing on in, in uh, chapter 12 of Corinthians there. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If it all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So God just kind of knit us together as a group of people. Right now, as a group of people who really don't know each other that well. So that we could accomplish a mission together for the city of Warman. And I guess we, as Grace Fellowship, as a leadership team, need you guys to help on the mission that God has for Warman. Sharing the gospel with those around us. And that's why we want to partner together with you. You may be an eye, a visionary who can see um, how to reach the city. We need you. You might be a hand, someone who's front lines helping people in their needs. You may be a foot, someone who takes people to the place of mission and motivates people to go where they wouldn't normally go. Maybe you're some other part of the body. But God is the head of this mission, and he's the one who will guide us on this mission together. So you might ask yourself, well, why do I officially need to partner with a local body of believers? Like, what difference does it make? Can't we do it without officially partnering? For me, there's many reasons when I look at the New Testament church that we can see why it is important that we're connected to a local body of believers. I'm just going to read a bunch of verses uh, quickly here just... Uh, to just kind of show you how the early church worked in Acts, Acts chapter 2, verses 41. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And then in verse 47 of Acts chapter 2, praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Then the church continues growing in Acts chapter 5, verse 14, and more than ever believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. And then moving along all the way to Acts chapter 16, verse 5. So the churches were strengthened in faith and they increased in numbers daily. So the church was growing in numbers in Acts. This is the early church, the first church, meaning more and more people were joining with them on mission. They were spreading the gospel and doing what we find in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 and 43. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. So we can see that in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 and 43, that they had devoted themselves to a local body of believers. Their numbers were being added to day by day. If they weren't committed to one another, and if they weren't part of one body, there would be no numbers being added. They would just be individuals. We can see that they not only devoted themselves to a local body of believers, but and I'll get into more of that later, but they devoted themselves to some actions as well, some things that they did. This was an outward visible sign that they were a part of that local body or that local expression of the church of Jesus Christ. We can see that one of the things that they devoted themselves to was the apostles' teaching in verse 42. This is one of the things you'll find here at Grace Fellowship. We will also be devoted to the apostles' teaching and to Scripture. This is what the apostles were teaching. In fact, we do devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching in a sense that a large part of the New Testament was written by the apostles by the power of the Holy Spirit. We are a church that is based on the Word. You will find that, meaning we hold a very high regard of Scripture. You will find that we preach through books of the Bible, and we do, and we do that so that we don't skip over hard or controversial sections of the Scripture. 
as a body of believers, we're going to be devoted to teaching these scriptures. And when you part lo- partner along with us, you're also showing that you hold a high regard for the scriptures and you want to learn about the scriptures and the truth contained in there, the gospel of Jesus Christ and how it changes us. It not only saves us, but the gospel continues to change us. We can find in verse 42 that not only did they devote themselves to, to the teaching, but also to the fellowship, which could also be translated to, to partnership. They were together physically in the same place, encouraging one another and doing all the, the one another's that we find in the New Testament. This is where they loved one another, Romans 13, 8. They encouraged one another in, in Thessalonians 5, 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. They served one another in Galatians 5, 13. They prayed for one another, James 5, 16. And the host of one another's happen when you're together. When you're together with other believers that are committed to you and to the same body of Christ as you. And this is where all of these things can happen. Whether you're together one-on-one or together in a small group of some sort or together with the entire group of local believers. This is where you will find the Holy Spirit working and the grace that he has for you is going to be found through the actions of others. In all the pray for one another, the love one another, serve one another, um, this is where you're going to receive that grace from others and give grace to others. This is how God offers grace to you and others. It's through other people. If you're the missing link in the body of believers, there are others who are not receiving what God has for them because you are missing in action. The part that you play is now void. And it's like having a goalie on your team with no eyes or no arm. It kind of defeats the purpose. It doesn't work. Some of these one and others take place one-on-one, like I mentioned, having a close friend just to keep you accountable to Christ. Some of them take place in a small group, such as uh, caring for one another when someone's sick, discussing scripture together, having meals together. And some of them take place in the entire large gathering, like corporate worship and teaching. And this is why... Um, We like to have all of these aspects of our lives as believers partnered uh, together for all of these things to happen. And we can see in verse 42 that they also devoted themselves to to the breaking of bread. So they got together for teaching and for fellowship. But also for this breaking of bread. Now, breaking of bread can kind of mean a couple of things, I guess. Typically, breaking of bread was used to describe a meal uh, in the New Testament. Um, You've heard the expression... The greatest invention since sliced bread. Well, believe it or not, they didn't have sliced bread back then. So bread would have been baked in a loaf. And during the meal, you would break pieces off. And that's where they get the expression breaking of bread. Everyone would get their fingers on on this loaf of bread to tear a piece off the big loaf. That's kind of gross, but whatever. Um, They were getting to know one another, offering anything to anyone who had need. If we read there, uh, we like to do this at Grace Fellowship as well. Not necessarily the breaking of the bread part, but having meals together, um, eating together, getting to know one another. We, uh, we like to get together over a meal in a small group. We have what we call um, community groups. We have three of them here in Warman, where you get together once a week. You eat a meal together. Uh, it's just a potluck every week. You care for one another. You fellowship with one another. Um, talk about uh, struggles or high points or maybe the scripture that you went through on Sunday. And these are some of the things that the breaking of the bread does. The other type of breaking of bread that we find important here at Grace Fellowship is what we like to call communion or the Lord's table. It represents Christ's body, which was broken for us. 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 26 says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this communion or breaking of the bread is something that we do most Sundays, and we're going to do that today. It reminds us of the sacrifice that Jesus has made for us. It reminds us of the fact that he gave up his perfect life to be broken and poured out for our salvation. And so we do this to remember what he's done, but then also to realize what he will yet do. Because he's coming again, as verse 26 says here, and we want to be reminded to be ready for that time when he will come. And the last of the four things that it mentions um, that the believers devoted themselves to in Acts chapter 2, verses 42, is prayer. You are committing yourself to pray for 
um, one another. You're committing yourself to, to pray for us as a leadership team when you partner with Grace Fellowship. We desperately need your prayers. We cannot do this on your own. Just as you can't walk this life on your own, you need others to partner with you and keep you accountable. You need others to pray for you. We need to commit to praying for each other as partners in Christ and partners on God's mission. We need to commit to praying for each other so that we can have that relationship with Jesus that we need so we can be a fully functional member of the body of Jesus Christ. Spend time with Jesus and you're going to start seeing a difference in the way that you function within the body of Christ. This no longer becomes your mission, but it becomes a mission to support the, the goal and the mission of the whole local expression of, or expression of the body of believers. Whatever part you play in that, prayer is, a, prayer is a humbling experience. When you realize that you're talking to the God of the universe, it starts to change your perspective. You start to see how small your part is, but yet how incredibly important it is. Just like your eye is a very small thing in your body, but how important is it? So when all of these things happen together, when you get a bunch of people who are nothing like one another, they have nothing in common, but that they all love Jesus, and they're all filled with the Holy Spirit, like we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and they all do the things that we read in Acts chapter 2, and they're committed to learning the scripture, to meeting together, and fellowshipping with one another, eating meals, and taking communion together, and praying for one another, what happens? If we go back to Acts chapter 2, verses 43, we see what happens with the early church when all these things happened. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now, I love this. And awe came upon every soul, it says. In other words, they were worshiping God. When we're in awe of God, we're worshiping God. This worship is just a complete um, amazement and awe of who He is, what He's done. Experiencing how big and how powerful and loving and awesome God is just drives us to worship Him. After all, it's all about Him, isn't it? It's not about us individually. It's about Him and His mission and His goals. If we love Jesus, we're going to automatically care for others because it's what Jesus calls us to do. We'll be committed to others and devoted to the spiritual growth of those around us. Ultimately, we are all about Jesus, what He's done and what He's continuing to do. That's what we're all about. Our worship of Jesus as a body of believers will all look differently when viewed individually, but when we, we put all of our worship together, we're going to see that God has placed us all in the body of Jesus Christ for a specific purpose in the larger goal, to reach the lost, grow God's kingdom. When we actually realize um, God's greatness, we can't hold it in. We can't keep it to ourselves. If we're holding in the good news of the gospel, we really, we really don't think it's that great of news. We might think that it's good news for us, but if you think about um, say when Team Canada wins gold in the World Junior Hockey Tournament, which they didn't this year, boo. But when they do, what happens? I mean, everyone's pumped about it, right? It's on the news. It's on like everyone's talking about it. I'm talking about it to everybody at work. It's just everyone's talking about it, right? But this good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I think we fail to realize how important and how awesome it is, because we're not talking about it all the time. We're not pumped about it. When we're all partnered together in the gospel and when we're all worshiping together and, and making much of Jesus, we see how big and how powerful and how awesome he is and what he's done for us. We won't be able to help but be pumped about the gospel of Jesus Christ. This story is something that needs to be shared. So if we're all together anyway, why do we really need to officially partner? Can't we do this without officially partnering? We're all together as a body of believers. We're diverse, and yet we're one in Christ because of the things that are common thing that we, we love Jesus Christ, and he's, he's part of our lives. Can't we do this without officially being part of a church? We could, probably, but it's far less likely. If we continue reading Acts chapter 2, we see here that there were things um, that characterized the early church um, as somebody, or as a group of believers that had a much tighter bond than we could have ever imagined. It's uh, more than we could ever imagine today, I think. If we read verses 44 to 47 in Acts chapter 2, we're going to see some crazy things that they did. And all who believed were together and they had all things in common. They were, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing 
the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Do you think that all this stuff would have happened if they weren't partnered together? I don't think so. If you're doing all this stuff with people that you don't quite know if they're committed to you, I, I don't think it wouldn't be. Ha- I don't think it'd be happening. They were eating meals together in one another's homes. They were selling their stuff so they could help others. They were generous. They were giving everything away. Now, this is a group of believers that was officially committed to one another. I don't don't think you'd be doing this to people that are just kind of, you know, hanging around the edges. I I don't think that's something that you you can do kind of on your own and just coming together once a week. You're doing this kind of mission together with people who are invested in your life and people who you've invested your life into. And I think that's one of, the more, uh, one of the important reasons why you need to officially partner with people. We know that you're partnered with us. We know that you're investing in us, and we know that we're investing in you. And one of the reasons why, as, as church leaders, I guess, we want you to commit to a body of Christ or a body of believers is it's sort of a selfish thing, and yet it's not really. Um, it is scriptural. And it's nice when my own selfish desires line up with scripture. It doesn't happen very often, but 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 it is nice. And so um, if we read Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, we're going to see some pretty strong words. And uh, Hebrews 13, verse 17, I'm going to read that verse right now. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Now, here, there are some really important aspects um, the church membership addressed. Uh, the first is that members must be obedient to leaders. And if, if you're not really committed to a body of believers, there's no obligation on your part to be obedient to anybody, which is actually kind of um, freeing and it feels good until you realize that the opposite is also true. There's no one that's obligated to help you along in your struggles or share in your victories. It's a very empty feeling. And the second aspect to this verse that for me is kind of the selfish part, I guess, is that your, your church leaders are going to give a, an account for you someday. And I would sure like to know who, who I'm going to give an account for. <laughs> I, uh, I don't want to stand before God one day and have him hold me accountable, accountable for someone whom I didn't know I'd be accountable for. I can't just say, well, he never really partnered with us on mission officially, so I feel he's not my responsibility. I, I don't think that's going to be okay for me. So we as a body of believers and leaders of that body need to know who's on mission with us and who's committed to all of the other members of this body. We want to be able to invest in your life and know that you want that investment. It's very hard to pour into someone's life if you don't know if they want you to pour into their life. And by being an official partner, you're saying, yes, we want others to pour into our lives and we want to pour into others' lives and invest in their lives. So how does this partnership really work at Grace Fellowship? And some of you have been members of other churches will know that often once you are a member, you're, you're a member for life. That's kind of how it often works, unless you revoke or transfer your membership. At Grace Fellowship, we do things a little differently, as I mentioned earlier. If you choose to partner with us for a short amount of time, we're happy to do that. Um, we often have students, a lot of university students in the Saskatoon Church where we came from, uh, they'll partner with us for nine or ten months. They'll put an end date on the partnership form. Then they're going to move back home for summer, and uh, then they're no longer partners with us because they're gone somewhere else in another part of the country or whatever. And for us, it's one way of keeping up uh, the membership lists up to date. But um, for us, it's also saying, okay, we're responsible for you while you're here in this particular moment of time when you're in our area and part of our mission. And uh, when you're gone and your life circumstances are different, it's totally fine. Um, you're no longer partners with us. We well, should partner with a local body of believers where you are. So that's kind of the way we do it. Um, for for most people, I guess for um, a lot of the people, it's for one full year. So or from whenever you sign the partnership form till January of next year. All partnerships, including mine, are always over at the beginning of the year. Um, we all recommit or move on, depending in, on your life situation. Um, but while you're here, you'll be partnered with us on mission to share the good news of the gospel, worshiping our Lord and Savior together and, and, and telling others what he's done for us. Um, 
So today is that Sunday. So those of you who are visitors here, welcome here. <laughs> it's uh, This is how we do it. It's a little different than, than most churches, but um, we want to encourage uh, those of you who know us and who know about us, who love Jesus Christ and want to be on mission for us, to partner with us officially in this mission that we're on and sharing the gospel in the city of Warman. We're very new, and so a lot of us don't um, know each other well. But we encourage you guys to get to know one another, partner with one another, start investing in lives of people that maybe you don't even know that well. Um, we want to be worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ together. We want to make much of Jesus. He's the only reason we're here, and He is who we want to worship and serve. And uh, we don't want to idolize the mission that we're on together as a church, but we do want um, to be on mission so that others can see Jesus. And that's the reason why. It's not so we have more people here or so that this church gets bigger. It's so that more people can see Jesus. And uh, if you have any other questions about what it means to be a partner of Grace Fellowship, uh, you can talk to Claire and myself. Or you can email us. Uh, our business cards are at the back. Um, it might see, We might seem like a strange uh, church the way we do things, but we find it works well. Uh, one of our, our main things is our community groups that get together once a week, typically. Um, we have three of them in Warman. If you're interested in uh, getting involved in one of them or just checking it out, just talk to either uh, Claire or myself or send us an email, whatever, whatever works best for you. We'd love to answer any questions that uh, you might have. Um, there are forms at the back, and I think Clay has them right here, and he's going to hand them out. Uh, they're called Partnership Covenant Covenants. You can take them home. You can read them. Uh, some of you already have them, obviously. But as of now, you're no longer a partner with Grace Fellowship, and so you have to re-sign the back page. Uh, we do also just have the back pages separately. Um, you can read them. You can return them at any time during the year, whatever works for you. You can put it, give it to Clay or myself or uh, put it in the offering box.